All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the remedial action permit application and remedial action report submittal frequently asked questions and flowchart training. Uh, we have another minute here. Um, actually, it's 9 a.m., so we'll get started. Um, we're on a pretty tight timeline today, so um, we're just going to jump right into it, and um, everybody that isn't here yet can just filter in. Um, so next slide, please. So my name is Celine, and I am co-moderating here today with Alexandra, who's also on screen. Uh, we are part of the DEP Contaminated Site Remediation and Redevelopment Training Committee. Next slide, please. Um, if you're here today for continuing education credits, um, the licensing board has approved one technical and one regulatory continuing education credit for this particular class. And in order for you to earn those, um, you have to be logged in for the entire training session today and you have to answer both poll questions. And these are going to be randomly inserted in the presentation, but we will have a test poll so that you can um, test it out and see how the poll works in a second here. Next slide, please. Um, so to get the CECs, uh, basically what we do for, as, you know, the DEP, we compile a list of webinar participants who are eligible to get these CECs, and then we provide that list to the LSRPA, and the LSRPA will then email the eligible participants with a link, um, and that link would be to an LSRPA webpage with certificate access instructions, and then you would pay a $25 processing fee and you will be issued your certificate. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the example poll question. Next slide, please. Okay, so this test poll um, is just to familiarize yourself with the poll. Um, so Tyrone, you can um, pull up the poll whenever you're ready, but the questions will be, um, why are you here today? And then you can just choose whether you're here to earn CECs, learn more about ECCC, or learn more about CSRR. Um, so CECs are your continuing education credit. ECCC is the Effective Collaborative Communications Committee. And CSRR is the Contaminated Site Remediation and Redevelopment. Um, so for the other polls that we're going to be doing today, Alexandra will be reading those when they're sprinkled in throughout the presentations. And um, you guys will have a minute to answer each poll. And then we'll go ahead and close the poll. But as a reminder, you have to answer both poll questions to be eligible to get credit. And you also have to be here for the entire training. Um, next slide, please. So we ask that the questions function be used here in GoToWebinar if you have any questions that you want to ask to the presenters. Um, we have specific question segments throughout the training today, and during those question segments, we will read aloud the questions that you guys have typed into the questions panel. Um, if a question isn't addressed during a question segment, we will answer it after the presentation via email. Next slide, please. So then there's also a chat function within the GoToWebinar platform, and um, we would like you to use that if you're having any technical issues or anything like that, just to let us know. But please don't use this to ask questions or to answer other people's questions, you know, kind of just use it to express any issues to us. Next slide, please. Um, so we would like you at the end to please fill out the course eval, which um, is through Survey SurveyMonkey, and we'll also post that um, now and at the end of the presentation in the chat. And um, you'll also have access to some course handouts, which will include um, the agenda, the link to the course eval, um, an acronym list, and also the um, materials that are going to be referenced throughout the presentation today. Next slide, please. So your job in this training today is to participate, complete the polls, and provide us with feedback through SurveyMonkey. Um, but that's it from my end. If you want to go to the next slide, we'll get um, opening remarks from the LSRPA. Thank you. Good morning. 
Um, I'm Michelle Clifford Tomaszewski, and I'm going to breeze through these LSRPA um, sponsors and upcoming events, and anyone who's taken these trainings knows what's going on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as always, the LSRPA couldn't do everything we do without our sponsors, so thank you for our diamond partners. Next, please. Our gold partners. Next, please. And our silver partners. Next, please. Um, as far as upcoming events, there's a roundtable coming up in August on site remediation in the age of environmental justice. Um, the LSRPA will also be offering an exam prep course for anybody who signed up to sit for the exam in October. Um, that's in September. Next, please. Also in September, we have a, um, another roundtable on understand, understanding the DKQP process. Um, and there's a presentation in October on understanding risks and liabilities for LSRPs remediating sites. Next, please. On the more fun and social events, the Cornhole Tournament is coming up in August. Um, it's at Martell's Tiki Bar, which is where the Battle of the Bands was as well. Uh, should be a great time. Hopefully there's some beautiful weather for us. Next, please. Then the annual golf fundraiser with SWEP um, is scheduled for October. This is always for a good cause. We raise a ton of money for scholarships for both SWEP and LSRPA. Next, please. And as always, you can stay connected and follow what's happening on social media, on the various platforms. Next, please. And there are happy LSRPA slides. Thank you again for all of our sponsors. Um, we're going to get started with the wrap presentation now, and I believe Julian is up next. Yes, um, Julian is our next presenter. Please, Julian, turn on your camera and microphone. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Julian Posey. I'm with the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting, and I'm going to uh, explain to you what the Effective Collaborative Communications Committee is. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> So um, ECCC is a um, stakeholder group made up of uh, six department members, um, two SHRIN members, and four LSRPs. Um, next slide. Uh, so uh, ECC's purpose. Uh, this committee was formed to focus on the remedial action uh, permit applications that we're receiving um, notices of technical deficiencies, but were ultimately still issued a permit. Uh, these deficient applications were contributing to the backlog of the uh, BRAP's, um, uh, excuse me, the backlog uh, that BRAP was dealing with due to um, all the back and forth communication uh, required to correct the deficiencies. Um, so today's training will provide discussions on uh, most of these uh, common issues that we were seeing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so the process the committee used to discuss the high deficiency rates was by having the department members present examples of the common issues uh, being seen with RAP applications and remedial action report submittals. Um, so PowerPoint presentations were used to provide uh, examples of the common issues, which led to productive discussions that allowed us to gain an understanding from each side's perspective on the issues. Um, as a result of these discussions, um, the following solutions were put into action. So the names of deficiency letters and the response policies uh, are now more consistent between uh, the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting and the Bureau of Inspection and Review. Um, these deficiency letters are now referred to as Notice of Incomplete Letters or NOIs. Uh, financial assurance um, mechanisms used for RAPs are now easier uh, to find on the department's website. 
uh, they can now be found on the forum's webpage uh, right there with the remedial action permit application forms. Um, and flowcharts were developed to provide um, a better understanding of BRAP's review process of RAP applications and BIR's uh, review process of RARs. And lastly, on uh, the next slide here, um, based on LSRP uh, member experiences with other helpful frequently asked question documents, uh, the committee decided to create a FAQ document um, as a helpful tool in addressing the high deficiency rates uh, being seen in RAP submittals. So the FAQs include questions and answers uh, to the following areas uh, related to RAP application and RAR submittals. There's um, an NOI RAP applications section, uh, financial assurance section, administrative issues related to RAP applications, um, as well as technical issues related to RAP applications, and administrative issues related to RARs, and also receptor evaluations. And the document also contains uh, flowcharts that illustrate the contaminated site remediation and re redevelopments review process of remedial action permits and RARs. And this document can be found on both the forums page and the guidance document page uh, in the remedial action permit sections. Um, and that's all I have for this segment. Thank you. Type our next slide, please. Thank you, Julian. Our next presenter is Robert. Robert, please turn on your camera and microphone. Thanks, Julian. Um, <clears throat> Some of, some of what I'm gonna say is gonna reiterate what Julian said, but uh, I'm Rob Fissler. I am a LSRP with, with Woodard and Current, and um, I was a member, I'm a member of the ECC group. Um, and given the number of people I think that are, are at this presentation, I'm assuming that more than one of, a, one of you have received a, a notice of technical deficiency or a notice of deficiency on a RAP application. And good news is, is you're not alone. Not alone. Next slide, please. Uh, numbers, these numbers are a little bit dated, but as of April 2022, 90% uh, of groundwater wrap applications and 45% of all soil wrap applications reviewed received a, a notice of deficiency uh, in one form or another. And the interesting thing was that <clears throat> ultimately only 20% of groundwater wrap applications and 10% of soil wrap applications were either withdrawn or rejected. And basically what, what is this telling us? It's telling us that the majority of, of applications that were reviewed were, were ultimately approved. Um, the issue was that there was just a lot of back and forth between department and LSRPs or, or persons responsible for conducting remediation. Um, and this is taking time, taking resources. Um, so as Julian indicated, um, you know, it was creating a, a backlog at the department. So uh, in April of 2022, uh, the, the EAT group was established. We met up every few weeks. It was made up of members of the regulated community, regulators, permit writers, and LSRPs. And among other things, one of the, the purposes was to try and come up with a list of common deficiencies um, and, and minimize the back and forth. Next slide, please. And this is the list. Um, incorrect, inaccurate administrative information like block lot, contaminants of concern, inaccurate descriptions in Exhibit C of the D notice, uh, m and groundwater wrap applications for free or residual product, an active groundwater wrap application for free and residual product with only sporadic recovery methods, on-site source of groundwater contamination not identified, incorrect financial assurance mechanism or incorrect language. Next slide. And lack of proper justification to support a variance or deviation. And these are some of the common areas, horizontal vertical delineation, insufficient groundwater sampling events to support M&A, uh, non-decreasing trends, stable trends for M&A, VI uh, not, not completed, and leaving concentrations of EPH above free and residual product threshold. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, that the, the justification didn't exist, it just wasn't properly documented. 
So let's go through them in a little bit more detail. Next slide, please. Uh, administrative issues. Um, a, lo a lot of the RAP applications that came in had incorrect block and lot, incorrect address, maybe an incorrect PI number, incorrect property owner, uh, constituents of concern, inconsistent with uh, RA report or deed notice, and cap construction details inconsistent with RA uh, or deed notice. So next slide, please. And a lot of our work, as we all know, is triggered by property transfers or redevelopment. Um, and, and through this process, you know, lots can be consolidated, bifurcated, property owners can change. Um, at, at times, because this process moves quick, our information might be more up-to-date than the information the department has or the information that is readily available on online databases. So... Before you submit, double check. Make sure you double check data miner and, and gems um, to see if your information matches. I believe department uh, relies on Monmouth County uh, online database for tax information. If your information doesn't match and you know it doesn't match, um, call it out. Uh, call it out either in Section K of the RAP application um, or a cover letter letting, letting the permit writers know that uh, there are some inconsistencies between what information you have. Uh, it might not be a, a up to date and this is the correct information. I guess the point is let the permit writer know it's coming. Otherwise there's gonna be back and forth. Um, and, and, and in order to eliminate that, just give them a heads up. Next slide, please. Um, so there were a number of RAP applications that had inconsistent details regarding constituents of concern or cap construction details. Um, just make sure, again, double check your RIR, make sure it matches the deed notice, make sure it matches the permit application. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys know the cost to fix a deed notice after it's been submitted, if it's incorrect, uh, will we'll greatly exceed the cost to just do a double check quickly before to make sure all all three match, your RA report, your deed notice, and your RAP applications. Next slide, please. So in talking about deed notices, um, you know, there's a number of the applications uh, that, that had a deed notice associated with it didn't accurately describe the purpose of the engineering control. And Exhibit C of the model deed notice should include a narrative description of the institutional control in C1, and a description of the engineering control in C2. So I guess the point is, if your engineering control is uh, intended to address the migration to groundwater pathway, it needs to say that. If it's intended to address inhalation direct contact, it needs to say that. If it's intended to address both, it needs to say that. There were a number of deed notices that were filed where the engineering control, part of the purpose was to address the migration to groundwater pathway, uh, and it didn't. So uh, that was, a, again, another issue that we were, they were seeing with deed notices. Next slide, please. Uh, groundwater source identification. So uh, what we learned were there, there were a number of groundwater wrap applications, which, you know, the, the supporting RARs, you know, had, had, Great discussion on, on complete delineation, downward, uh, downward trends in, in groundwater concentrations. But what they didn't do is they didn't really accurately uh, talk about or depict the, ground, the, the source to groundwater contamination. You know, RAR figures in your uh, groundwater report should you know, identify where active remediation was conducted in relation to the existing monitoring well network. I guess the point in here is department really wants to understand the what, where, and why. You know, what remediation was conducted, where it was conducted, and why it is no longer a contributing source to groundwater. Next slide, please. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. M&A wrap application for free uh, or residual product. Uh, tech regs specifically state person responsible for conducting remediation shall treat or remove free product and residual product to the extent practical or contain free product and residual product from treatment or removal is not practical. Monitor natural attenuation of free product and residual product is prohibited. Free residual product, they do require active groundwater remedial action permits. Next slide, please. 
So if you do have free and residual products, um, and, and it, it, you know, it is an active category wrap, uh, it must include some type of long-term recovery methods. You know, one example is pump and treat, but it can't just be limited to short-term interim remedial measures, like periodic uh, uh, EFRs, manual recovery by bailing, or sorbent pads or socks. Next slide, please. Uh, financial assurance issues. Um, again, a number of uh, permit applications came in with incorrect financial assurance uh, uh, documents. You know, any any soil wrap that includes the use of an engineering control, active groundwater wraps, and MA wrap, uh, groundwater wraps with VI mitigation require FA uh, be secured prior to submitting your remedial action permit applications. Um, and these are some examples of the the uh, uh, available financial assurance, uh, but make sure you secure it before, or make sure it is secure before you submit your RAP application, and just make sure you're grabbing the correct form uh, on DP's website. Next slide, please. Uh, variance and deviations. So in accordance with the tech regs, all variances need to include a regulatory citation uh, for the technical requirement. Uh, how the variance deviates from the regulatory requirement and rationale supporting information that the variance is protective. For example, multiple lines of evidence and independent professional judgment. Um, and deviations also need to have a rationale justification for the deviation. Um, next slide, please. The department recognizes, they, they understand that not all rules and guidance apply to every situation. And the point is, you know, any variance or deviation needs to be supported by multiple lines of evidence. Um, identify the variances and deviations in Section K, a wrap application, and, and point to the section of the RAR where they're detailed. You know, suggestion is, 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 is call them out in their own section. You know, own them. Don't bury them. Um, you know, it's important to let permit writers know that these are coming. Um, so just, again, call them out. Don't bury them in, in, in some miscellaneous uh, area of the report, call them out in their own section, identify them in Section K of the RAP application, uh, let the permit writers know. I think that's it. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, our next presenter will be Julian again. For the okay, I'm back. Um, <clears throat> I'm now going to discuss um, the RAP application flowchart that we developed. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so this is the RAP application uh, flowchart, which is found at the end of the document. Um, this flowchart illustrates the department's review process of RAP applications from start to finish. Uh, this shows us when it first comes into um, the Bureau of Case Assignment and Initial Notice uh, down to when the RAP application is either issued or withdrawn. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so zoomed in here, uh, this shows when the RAP application is first submitted to the Bureau of Case Assignment and Initial Notice, um, also known as BCAME. This bureau is responsible for the data management, um, cursory review, and distribution of um, remedial site document submissions uh, to the other groups within the program. So for RAP applications, um, BCANE conducts an administrative review uh, of the RAP application, and um, my next slide will show what that review looks like. Um, if issues are found, uh, BCANE sends a notice of administrative deficiency, also known as an NAD. Um, they request 30 days to address the deficiencies. And box one here shows uh, the steps taken after an NAD is issued. And once the administrative review is complete, um, the RAP application is sent to the BRAP supervisors. Next slide. So what does uh, BCANE look for in their review of the RAP application submittal? 
Uh, BKN conducts an administrative review to ensure that the following items are complete and correct, and that includes uh, appropriate fees are paid, all sections of the application are filled out with proper signatures provided. Um, they're checking to see that site information matches current tax records and that, NG and that it matches uh, what we have in NGEMS and data miner. Uh, they're looking to see that the paper copy of the RAP application form is provided and the electronic copies of the required documents from Section F of the RAP applications are also provided and that the original financial assurance mechanism and remediation cost review and remedial funding source RFS FA form have been submitted uh, when applicable. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so once the administrative review is complete by BKANE, the application is assigned to a BRAP supervisor. Um, so the supervisor assigns the RAP application to either a soils or groundwater RAP reviewer. If both a soils and groundwater RAP application are sent in together, uh, the supervisors should assign them to the same reviewer. Um, and we have uh, question nine in the FAQs. Uh, this provides instructions on how to find out if a permit reviewer has been assigned to your case. So the permit reviewer then conducts a technical review of the RAP application. Uh, this review may uh, be conducted alongside their supervisor or through technical support, depending on complexity of the review. Um, the technical support that BRAP works with um, are the bureaus of groundwater pollution abatement and environmental evaluation and risk assessment, um, or BIRA. So groundwater pollution abatement provides geological support for traditional and direct oversight cases in addition to uh, department reviewers and inspectors for any cases with groundwater contamination. And BIRA provides uh, similar support, but for cases involving ecological assessments, um, alternative remediation standards, uh, natural background determinations, and vapor intrusion issues. So the permit reviewer uh, reviews all the required documents that are provided for the permit application. And as I said, the more complex cases, um, they may be referred to technical support for further review. Um, for example, groundwater pollution abatement, uh, they may review a bedrock investigation on behalf of the permit reviewer. Um, or <clears throat> in some instances, uh, a permit reviewer will conduct a peer review with someone at technical support. Um, an example of this might be a permit reviewer conducting a peer review with uh, BIRA to discuss a deviation from the department's uh, vapor intrusion technical guidance. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so uh, what does BRAP look for when reviewing uh, the soil wrap application submittal? The following items should all be provided uh, in order for a permit reviewer to complete their technical review of the soil wrap application. Um, so as previously indicated, uh, the information on the soil wrap application must be consistent with the deed notice. So sections G and H of the wrap application must match the information in the deed notice. Um, it's also important to mention that um, all financial assurance documents and remediation cost review and RFS FA forms are now reviewed by the financial assurance unit um, prior to BRAP's technical review. Next slide. Uh, what does BRAP look for when reviewing the groundwater wrap application submittal? Um, the following items should all be provided in order for a permit reviewer to complete their technical review of the groundwater wrap application. Um, a current uh, CEA well restriction area uh, fact sheet form should always be provided. Um, contaminant data and CEA calculations should be based on 
current conditions when submitted with a wrap application. Uh, the CEA shape should be based on current conditions. So a CEA, a, um, CEA approval at the remedial investigation stage, um, that may not be appropriate at the remedial action stage and should be re revised as necessary. <clears throat> While modeling by extrapolation may be used at the remedial investigation stage to demonstrate CEA extents, actual clean zone sampling uh, data must be used to demonstrate delineation is complete at the conclusion of the remedial action and prior to the department issuing a groundwater wrap. Uh, when the items from these past two slides are not provided or are found to be completed incorrectly or inconsistently with department rules and guidance without providing uh, sufficient justification, the department may issue a notice of incomplete wrap application letter. Uh, next slide. Um, so this section on the bottom of the flow chart, um, this illustrates the steps taken uh, by BRAP after completing the review and when issuing the NOI wrap application. Um, and Lynn Mitchell will go into further detail on this uh, later in the training, um, mainly uh, regarding box four here um, for the NOI process. Um, and that's all I have for you on this segment. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Our next presenter is Dominic. Dominic, please turn on your webcam and unmute. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Dominic Kudica. Uh, I'm a reviewer with the Bureau of Inspection Review. Just some background on me. I started off at the department as an hourly in the Division of Water Monitoring and Standards back in 2018, and I've been in BIR ever since uh, September of 2019 as a reviewer. Uh, today I'll be discussing the uh, RAR flow chart. Next slide, please. This is a quick overview of the flow chart. Um, and just as an FYI, this same flow chart and process can be applied through every other submission that BIR receives. Uh, so PA, SI, RI, RA, RAOs, um, they're gonna go through the same uh, process as well as if uh, there was a, a wrap application submitted along with the uh, RAR or not. Next slide, please. Uh, so to begin, uh, so the RAR submitted, all non-RAO remedial phase documents uh, are submitted through the ESA Middle Service, and then this updates NGEMS. Um, this gets assigned to the RAR inspection supervisors, uh, who then will go ahead and, and assign them to the actual inspectors. Uh, so what the inspectors do is review the RAR, uh, as well as any additional forms and documents submitted um, for any potential referrals. Um, if the RER is referred for a technical review, then they'll create the tasks and they'll assign them to uh, separate review team supervisors as applicable. So uh, as you'll see on the next slide, and I'll talk more about it later, we have four review teams, soil, groundwater, eco, and VI. So it may be assigned to one or multiple of those. Um, if, if the RER is not referred for technical review, it is closed and marked complete. Um, for RARs, they'll usually have a technical review, especially if there is um, a wrap application with it. Uh, an example of something that you know may be uh, closed out without needing a technical review would be you know a quick um, remediation, for example, a UST excavation. Maybe there's no signs of you know a release. Uh, all post X samples are, are non-detect, and there's an RAO submitted uh, that might not need a technical review, but we do uh, do administrative reviews for all RAOs um, to make sure that the language is good. Uh, next slide, please. So if it gets assigned a technical review, the review team supervisors assign those tasks to their respective reviewers. Um, as I said, there may be multiple review tasks assigned to different review teams for the same case, and they may not all be reviewed concurrently, um, depending on the complexity of the review. The review may be conducted by the reviewer alone, uh, conducted with their supervisor, 
conducted as a peer review with technical support. So this would be through Bureau of Groundwater Pollution Abatement for groundwater teams, um, and then Bureau of Environmental Evaluation and Risk Assessment, aka BIRA, um, for uh, soil, eco, and VI. Or if uh, it's very complex uh, site and case, they may just be completely referred over to test technical support for their review. Uh, when a remedial action permit is submitted with the RAR, uh, BRAP will review the portions of the RAR only applicable to that RAP application. Um, BIR does not duplicate the reviews of, the, of whatever is within the RAR, but if there's other things that are not a part of the RAP application, then BIR may get that as a review. Um, and then there's more information if you want to look at uh, RAP flowchart box three. Um, that Julian just presented on. Next chart, please. I mean, slide, please. So if uh, there was issues found during the review, um, then we'll uh, create an NOI and, and send that to the LSRP. They may be contacted by multiple reviewers for the same RAR, as I said, um, depending on how many different review teams are, are looking at it. Um, it may be contacted by separate BIR reviewers, though we do try to pool comments together before sending them all out. Um, but here and there, you might get, you know, if there's missing tables, for example, or something that, uh, you know, a groundwater reviewer needs, then they may just send that out real quick just to get those so they can keep, complete their review. Um, or if uh, if the review is uh, referred completely over to technical support, Bureau of Groundwater Pollution Abatement or BIRA, then the reviewer from, from over there uh, may send the technical comments to the LSRP on their own. So the NOI uh, will request acknowledgement within seven days just to make sure that uh, it's you know, on your radar that you receive the, the NOI and all issues are expected to be addressed within 60 days um, if acknowledgement is not received within those seven days, then we'll send a reminder notice. Um, and if issues remain unresolved after those 60 days and a request to withdraw is not received um, within those 60 days, the department will update the status of the document as rejected incomplete. And uh, later on, we'll have a presentation uh, going more into depth on uh, NOIs. So if all uh, issues are addressed, um, or if there's just no uh, technical re review required for the submission, um, then we'll close the RAR and update the status as completed. Um, but please note that a completed review status does not uh, constitute an approval of the RAR or indicate that BRAP has completed a review of the RAP application. And uh, we'll go into uh, how you can look up um, what the status of the RAR is uh, later on. I think that's all the slides I have for this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. Um, our next speaker will be Lynn. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. I am Lynn Mitchell. I am the Assistant Director of the Remediation Review Element. Um, next slide, please. I'll be going over questions two and questions three on the FAQ document. Um, so. What you see here on the slide is um, the question and the answer as it appears in the FAQ document. So question two is what is expected when the department issues an NOI? Um, next slide, please. This is the continuation of the answer as it appears in the FAQ document. Next slide, please. But what does this really mean to you? So. We changed, first thing to note is that we changed the name of the letters that we send out um, from notices of technical deficiency to notices of incomplete. Um, our response times have changed from 30 days to 60 days. This means that during those 60 days, you can either conduct additional remedial measures, provide us information, or do both. So an example is, um, if the department sends out in their NOI a comment that states that delineation was not complete, you have the option of conducting additional sampling, 
providing justification to the department as why you thought your delineation was complete, or both. Um, if the 60 days is not enough time for you to conduct your sampling or to provide your information to us, please just withdraw the permit application or the key document. So again, com um, continuing with my example, if you find that when you did your additional delineation samples that you needed to, you, those samples were also dirty and you needed more time to mobilize, again, to take additional samples, please just withdraw your document at that point. Um, if you do withdraw your document, you will need to submit a new document, an application report that addresses all of the issues raised um, in our NOI when you resubmit it. Next slide, please. Um, if you don't address everything satisfactorily within the 60 days, um, the department will deem your application incomplete, will reject it as incomplete. If timeframes has been missed, then enforcement actions may be taken. Next slide, please. We are going to do a poll question now to test your knowledge. Next slide, please. Uh, poll question number one. You have 60 days to respond to an NOI wrap application or an NOI key document submittal. A for true, B for false. Just a reminder that you do need to answer these questions in order to um, qualify for the credits. I'll take this time to also remind everybody to fill out the survey monkey. The link is in the chat. I don't know. I will be adding it again. There is a um, air monitoring training and field sampling procedure manual training that will be coming up later on this year. So please keep an eye out for that event or training event. Okay, next slide, please. The answer is true. Okay, thank you. Okay, next slide, thank you. All right, so we are on to question three. Um, again, um, what you see here is the question and the answer as it appears in the FAQ document. So the question is, how can the concerns um, be addressed if there's disagreement with the comments raised in your um, NOI application or key document submittal. Next slide, please. So again, what does this mean? So first I want everybody to be assured that super, supervisors are aware of what staff is sending out in their notices of incomplete. The issues, if they had any, were already raised, um, so they are aware of what is being sent out. If a disagreement is made with the, with the comments, Please provide your response within 60 days. That's fine. We may have missed something. Um, that happens. We couldn't find it. You tell us. You elaborate. Understood. You know, it's just a question that we have. Um, if your um, staff has been instructed to respond to the NOIs as soon as they get them to expedite this process. So if, they, if you respond to them, great. They should be responding back to you as soon as they can. Um, if you ask them a question or if you have some concerns about what was in the letter, they will get back to you as soon as possible. If they're away and their delay is part of the 60 days, we will, of course, extend your 60 days because of that. Next slide, please. But I do understand that there are going to be times when there's just not agreement between you and the staff who is writing your letter, the letter to you. That's okay. That will happen. 
not a concern. Please just raise your concerns to the next level. When they send a letter to you, the supervisor will be on that, will be a copy there. Please raise your concern to the supervisor. They will then raise the concerns through management and eventually, if necessary, to me. If you don't get an adequate response from the supervisor, raise it to the bureau chief. Then raise it to me. We are here to help you with that. Please don't go through the tech consult process because that's for when, before you make your submittal for the permit application, before your RIR is submitted, um, or before your RIR is submitted, you know, sim go to the, the tech consult before the document submitted. Don't use the tech consult to bypass going through the management chain. That is it. Thank you, I believe. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and um, address some audience questions now. So I'm going to read it aloud, and then any um, presenters that would like to answer, just come on camera and um, answer. So the first question is, um, how does the department address technical issues related to professional judgment? For instance, due to the length of a plume, an LSRP includes two side gradient wells on each side, but the NJDP reviewer or supervisor would prefer more than two. Um, okay, so I'm not here to answer a site-specific technical question um, to give an answer to this because there are lots of site specifics that could change an answer here. But again, my answer is the same. If the if you provide information to the supervisor and say this is the information, and you feel confident that your information addresses to the concerns, please request a meeting with their supervisor, with the next level of management. So maybe it's with their supervisor or with the bureau chief. They will then, internally we will meet, discuss it, and then we will set up a meeting with you, um, or just send you a letter saying we agree with you. Um, we are here to help with that process, to work through that process, not make it harder, but um, we want to answer, we want to address those questions as quickly as we can so that we can resolve the issues without having them drag on. My point with the 60 days is to make sure that you don't keep arguing with the staff back and forth with the same people. Raise the issue up, get new eyes on it, because a lot of the times we're not aware that the issues are occurring. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Um, our next question is, for sites where extensions were granted conditionally on permit approval, is there a plan to allow for additional extensions to the timeframes so that sites are not automatically placed in direct oversight? There shouldn't have been any conditional approvals given on any remedial action permit letters that have gone. You either have a permit or you don't. So if you were given time to do your work, um, if a staff member gave you an extra 60 days to do something, then you have it, be happy, um, just get it done within that time frame. Um, the 60 days is what we're going with from this point forward. Okay, thank you. The next question we have, um, are requests for meetings always granted? If we if there is an issue remain, remaining, yes, we will grant the meeting. If we agree with you, then we'll just probably agree with the document and then possibly not meet with you because there would be nothing to discuss. That would probably get more of a phone call. Okay. Um, next question. Is a new time frame issued when a wrap is withdrawn? Time frames run with the case. So if you have a time frame, your time frames exist from the date of the discharge, or if it's a statutory time frame, that's what the, the time frames that you have. Um, time frames do not change um, because a document is withdrawn. So if you will go out of compliance you, and you miss a time frame because the document is withdrawn or rejected as incomplete, you will have to deal with um, enforcement. Um, Lynn, we, just to backtrack a little bit, a clarification note just came in from the person who asked the question about um, 
I'll just add, read the first question again. For sites where extensions were granted conditionally on permit approval, is there a plan to allow for additional extensions to the timeframes so that sites are not automatically placed in direct oversight? So we just got some clarification and she wrote, not conditional approval of a permit, but conditional approval of an extension. As I said, if an extension is, if a staff member previously gave you 90 days to get something done, then you have that 90 days from the day that they said that you could do it. Um, so there is, so keep with what they said. We're not going back, but from this point forward, you will only be getting 60 days to respond. But if they gave you, if a permit writer or reviewer said, yes, you have time, then you have the time that they gave you. Okay, great. So how often and quickly do the completed review status get updated in the LSRP's comprehensive report and data miner? As soon as we complete, data miner is in, is a, is exactly what we put in NGEMS. So the minute that we hit completed and you run a report, it will show as completed. It is accurate to the, I would say second, I guess, not even minute. It's, it's a live document. Okay. Um, the next question, are the review and response timeframes you are citing regulatory or administrative slash policy related? I was talking about regulatory, mandatory, statutory timeframes saying that if you exceed one of those time frames, then you would be under enforcement. The 60 days is a policy that we are allowing you to do the work in those 60 days. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, I think we should go ahead and move on. And we can address more questions later. Our next presenter is Marlene. Marlene, please turn on your camera and unmute. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marlene Linhart. I'm an LSRP, uh, have been one since 2012, and am currently a member of the LSRPA Board of Trustees. I've been working in environmental remediation for the past uh, 40 years or so, and I was one of the participants on the ECCC work group. I'm going to go through the administrative questions and answers for RAP applications, and I'm going to close with some tips to uh, help complete the applications. And just wanted to make a note that some of the information that you're going to hear is repeated. Uh, um, it's really just to emphasize some of the common issues that we found during our work group. Next slide. So question four asks, what does BKANE look for in the review of the RAP application submittal? Um, just as Lynn said earlier, this is the exact answer that's posted online, so you can read the details there. And Julian did uh, lay these out earlier. Uh, but the answer basically lists the information required, that the form is complete, that the required attachments are required. Um, always make sure that the fees are paid and that the information in your application matches what's in data mine. Next question. How soon after the RAR is submitted should the RAP application be submitted? Uh, basically, the application should be submitted at or close to the same time as the RAR. Uh, it's important to remember that the RAR is not considered complete until the RAP application uh, has been submitted, so this could affect you meeting your time frames. Next, next slide. If the LSRP has only been retained for a specific area of concern, can a RAP be issued for that AOC? And the answer to that is yes. It's not uncommon for there to be multiple AOCs with different time frames on large sites. Uh, when this happens, the AOCs could be on separate tracks. Next slide. So here's an example where that happened. Um, a site had a benzene, tylene, ethylbenzene, and xylene discharge from UST in the late 1980s. Contaminated soil was removed and in-situ groundwater treatment conducted. Based on updated standards, the BTEX was shown to be remediated, but then PCE was detected above standards. Additional treatment was conducted and MNA implemented. 
While this case was ongoing, the owner wanted to transfer the property and wanted a site-wide REO to reduce his liability. So multiple AOCs were identified and investigated. This is not an ISRA or EPRA case. Because the UST case was advancing, an AOC-specific RER for soil and groundwater was completed, a wrap for groundwater M&A obtained, and an AOC-specific REO issued. Next slide. And if you can see this, this uh, just illustrates the site. The groundwater plume is over there on the eastern side of the site. But you can see that there are multiple AOCs that were later identified throughout the site. An investigation and remediation continued for the remaining site AOCs. Next slide. So what information should be included in the section of the RAP application titled Other Information Provided, which I commonly refer to as Section K. And this uh, response lists typical information um, to provide, but it's really very site-specific, uh, depending on your circumstances. It's very important to call out the variances and deviations. Don't leave them buried in the RER because this will delay your review. It's also important to make a note if you're including poor quality tables and figures from old reports. Sometimes these are the best uh, copies that we have, but make a note in Section K so that the reviewer knows that and doesn't think that uh, they need to ask you for a better copy of something. If you have more information than uh, you can provide in Section K, submit additional information with a cover letter and attach it to the RAP application. Next slide. So this is question eight. Are alternative remediation standard forms with SPLP spreadsheets required to be submitted with the soil wrap application when applying alternative remediation standards to the MGW exposure pathway? No, these should be included in the RAR unless they were previously submitted in the RIR. If they were included in the RIR, reference them in the RAR and also in section K of the soil wrap application. And just make sure that when you're submitting SPLP spreadsheets that you confirm that you're using the current version of the SPLP calculator. Next slide. So question nine, where can information regarding who is assigned to review the RAP application be found? This is one of my favorites personally. Um, the answer to question nine provides the instructions for the data mining report and gives you the status of your permit. This report is only used for permit applications under review. So once the permit is issued, it will not appear in this report. Next slide. So to illustrate the steps, first click on search by category at the data miner screen, then select pending permit progress report. Next slide. At the next screen, select Pending Permit Progress by Program ID. The tongue twister, I can't say too fast. At the next screen, next slide, select all and type in the PI number. Next slide. And this shows an example of a report. So this particular application was submitted in May and the review by BK was completed. You can see that there, it has the dates. The supervisor, Mike Infiger, is shown, which means it's still to be assigned to a permit reviewer. Um, for permits that are further along in the process, you'll see much more detail in the report, and hopefully this will help you understand the status of the review. Next slide. So for question 10, what version of the RAP application should be used? Always check that the latest version of forms are used each time a RAP application is to be submitted. Um, and if an old form is used, BK may ask for the application to be resubmitted during the current application. Um, cutting and pasting from old forms could result in a delay of the application review, and this applies to any of the forms needed for hard copy submittals. Just always, it's a good practice just to check and make sure that you've got the current form that you're following. Next slide. So the next set of slides provides some tips on completing RAP application. Following these has worked for me personally, but keep in mind that site conditions vary and you need to provide the appropriate level of detail for your site. 
to review the RAP application form instructions and the applicable guidance. Um, it, it's better to just to go over it each time, uh, just to remind yourself of what the requirements are and see if anything has changed. I would recommend that the LSRP completes the RAP application form, but if a staff member is used to complete the form, the LSRP should carefully review it and double check for typos. And just remember that the LSRP is responsible for certifying the submittal. Next slide. So these tips apply to both soil and groundwater wrap applications. Uh, some of this has been said before, uh, but we're trying to emphasize that these are the issues that happen often. Check that the Section A information matches what is shown in Data Miner. Include the municipal blocks and lots for the entire site not just your AOC. Uh, there are two sites here that uh, you can check as far as um, deed, notice, uh, deed notice information for the tax lots. Um, this Monmouth County site is commonly referred to as a Monmouth County site, but it actually, uh, you can get uh, more than Monmouth County. I've used it for Mercer, I've used it for Essex. Um, it's a really useful site. If you're not familiar with it, check it out, bookmark it. It's very helpful to get you the tax information that you need. And check out that all the fees have been paid when the application is submitted. Uh, print the data reminder report and have it in your file in case that is a question that comes up. Next slide. So check with the PRCR and confirm that the fee billing contact information is correct. Uh, confirm that the PRCR con contact information is correct. And if it's not correct, it's changed since previous submittals. Submit a site contact and information update form. So the LSRP does not have to certify this form. It's a, basically a courtesy. You can do it for the PRCR or the PRCR could send it in on their own. Uh, also confirm the property owner contact information. If people retire, properties get sold. It's not uncommon for this information to change over the life of a uh, site remediation. Next slide. So confirm that the required documents are provided and in the proper format, which could be hard copy, CD, or online. And if it was an online submittal, include a copy of the notice that the document was submitted. You'll get an email back when you submit a document online. Make liberal use of Section K to describe the issues that could affect the review and issuance of the wrap, and make sure you include specific references to variances from regulations and deviations from guidance. Um, We've heard this a few times today, it's really important. Make sure all the property owner information is correct and review the addendum requirements and submit the addendum if necessary. Next slide. So some specific tips for the soil wrap applications. Uh, and I know that Rob went over some of these earlier, but confirm that the deed notice information on the form matches the actual deed notice. If it doesn't, you'll need to explain that. If the county doesn't supply a book and page number, state not available. I believe Essex County doesn't do that anymore. Uh, there may be some other counties doing that also. If historic fill is impacting groundwater, you have, you have contaminated groundwater from a different discharge. You will need separate and overlapping CEAs. So check the historic fill requirements. It could be contaminated confirmed from historic fill. It could be assumed from uh, historic fill. Uh, but you will need to follow the requirements and get separate permits if necessary. And for questions that refer to the RAR, and I'm talking about questions on the form, go back to the RAR and confirm that the information in the RAR is correct and complete. For contaminants at the site, list all the contaminants still present that require the use of a deed notice. And check the RAR data tables, confirm the concentrations and depths, and cross-check that to what's in the deed notice. Next slide. So check that the information for the engineering control matches Exhibit C of the deed notice. I knew that Rob went into some detail on that earlier. Uh, financial assurance is only required if the engineering control is present. Follow the instructions for the RFS FA form and use the correct model letter. This is another very common problem, and I know that Jen is going to speak more about this later. In Section J, vapor intrusion summary applies when BI issues are the result of soil contamination, not groundwater contamination. Next slide. 
Some tips for the groundwater RIP application. Confirm the plume delineation or explain the variance from the tech rates. Heard about this before. For MNA, confirm that the requirements have been met from the MNA guidance document or explain the deviance. Confirm the sentinel well location and results or explain the deviance. And confirm that remediation of soil and free and or residual product has been done or explain the deviance. Uh, it's a pattern here. Basically, they're looking for explanations when there are deviances uh, from uh, regulate or variances from the regs and the guidance. For active groundwater remediation, confirm that you've had decreasing concentrations or stable plume. If an off-site source is present, make sure to include the hotline communication number from when you called that in. And if contamination is due to natural background, provide an explanation. Don't just say it's natural background. Next slide. So financial insurance for groundwater is only necessary if there's an engineering control for groundwater or VI. Follow the instructions for the form and again use the correct model letter. Check that the identified land use for the CEA matches the current property use under the CEA area. Confirm that the VI investigation was completed for the trigger area and check that the form information matches the RAR and other applicable reports. This has been another common issue uh, that's uh, caused some delays in getting the permits approved. And then just confirm that you've addressed the uh, potable well issue of the site. In the close, just keep in mind that the permit reviewer does not know the history of the site. The easier you make it to find the information, the quicker the review can be completed and the permit issued. And that's all I have. Great, thank you so much, Marlene. Um, our next presenter is Jennifer. Good morning. I am Jennifer McLeod, and I am the Remediation Funding Source Coordinator in the Fund Management section. Um, as you may have heard, the Fund Management section is now processing and reviewing all of the financial assurance related to um, engineering controls on permits. Next slide, please. So financial assurance is required when there is an engineering control, either for soil, groundwater, or vapor, and one or both co-permittees are not exempt from posting. So if one is and one is not exempt, then financial assurance is required. If you're required to have financial assurance, then with your initial RAP application, you need to include the original hard copy, signed, executed financial assurance mechanism. Uh, by mechanism, we mean the actual letter of credit, line of credit, trust fund, um, the uh, form that your client has chosen to post these funds in. Also needs to be included is the remediation cost review and RFS FA form. We call that the RCR form, and that has to include the detailed cost estimate for your financial assurance. That's the operation maintenance and monitoring cost based on the number of years of your CEA or 30 years for a permanent engineering control or an indeterminate CEA duration. Also, department fees should be included in your estimate. As has been stated several times in this training, missing or incorrect financial assurance documents can result in your permit being delayed or even withdrawn. Next slide, please. So how does the financial assurance review fit into this flow chart? Um, as Julian pointed out, BKIN is going to get your application first, and they're going to be checking if the financial documents are included if they're required. That just means, is there a mechanism? Is there an RCR form? Um, with the understanding that sometimes the original financial assurance mechanism has to be mailed directly to what is now the Remediation Funding Source Financial Assurance Unit. This is typically when banks have to provide the original directly to the beneficiary. So, um, you know, we're going to be coordinating with BKANE. Um, essentially, we'll confirm that there is an original document in-house, and if they are, then those forms will move on to the Remediation Funding Source Financial Assurance Unit, 
If they're not included and they were supposed to be, you may receive a notice of administrative deficiency from BKN, and you should follow that process. Next slide, please. So once BKN finds the documents, they will forward them again to the RFS FA unit, and we are going to be doing, um, it's not a technical review, but we'll be doing a review to make sure the documents are complete and acceptable. Um, I know one of the biggest issues brought to the department's attention um, was related to the timing of the review of the financial assurance. So the RFS FA unit is hoping that we will be reviewing the FA in advance of BRAP doing the technical review on the permit so that, you know, your financial assurance issues aren't holding up your permit being issued. Next slide, please. So the acceptable financial, finan the acceptable financial assurance mechanisms you can use include a letter of credit, line of credit, remediation trust fund agreement, environmental insurance policy, and a surety bond. And also, if you um, have a condo association or a homeowners association, and they include the operation and maintenance costs in their annual budget, that can be provided in place of one of these other mechanisms. The financial assurance model documents have now all been updated with a new beneficiary address using the mail code 401-06K. That is so that these documents come to the fund management section. Uh, they're all online. Please make sure if you have these model documents saved to your own desktops at home or laptops um, that you're updating to the, the new versions. Some tips, I guess, to make sure that you're using the financial assurance version and not the remediation funding source version because we both use the same uh, mechanisms is first to look at the beneficiary address. Does it say financial assurance coordinator or does it say remediation funding source coordinator? Uh, that's the first clue. And then secondly, there's always a citation. So the citation for financial assurance is NJSA 58-10C-19, whereas the RFS documents are going to reference um, Brownfield's Chapter 3. Next slide, please. So the model documents can be found online on the SRP forms library page. This is actually a snippet directly from the forms library page. The financial assurance model documents have now been placed directly under the remedial action permit forms and applications. So, you know, just in succession, you do the application, pick your model document. Next slide, please. They can still also be found on the RFS FA guidance webpage. You just want to make sure that you're scrolling down to the middle of the page and that you're in the financial assurance section. Next slide, please. So once your client has chosen uh, the mechanism they're going to use and you've downloaded the model document, you want to make sure that the lender is not changing the language. Nothing can be changed. Do not email me asking to change a sentence. Um, we can't accept any modifications. If the lender is not cooperating and they don't want to use the financial assurance model document, then it may be time for your client to look for a new lender that will use our model document and conform to our language. Uh, next slide, please. So what happens if the... RFS FA unit uh, reviews your financial assurance documents and finds a deficiency. We're going to be issuing an email for the corrections. Um, I believe at this time we're giving 30 days initially, and if it's not resolved, another, resolved another 30 days um, so that we're coinciding with the total 60-day process. Um, and if it's not resolved in 60 days, it'll be referred back to BRAP and it may be deemed incomplete. Next slide, please. So the frequently asked questions that are in the ECC document related to financial assurance include question 11, which states, will the department accept copies of a letter of credit or line of credit agreement? And the answer is no. We need the original signed document, and this actually applies to all of the mechanisms, not just letter of credit or line of credit. The only one we can sometimes uh, use a copy for is a remediation trust fund agreement, but even then in ARCs it's required to have the original, and we prefer to have the original. Next slide, please. 
what financial documents should be used for RAP application. Again, this speaks to what are the mechanisms available to you and then which version should you be using. So we've again given the links for both the forms library page and the RFS FA guidance webpage online. Next slide, please. Question 13, what information should financial institutions include on the financial assurance mechanism? So this should be your site, remediation program, program interest number, your SRPPI, um, if you have a spillet case or an ISRA case that's applicable, obviously the site name, the site address. We're looking for anything that you can provide on this mechanism uh, that may be helpful for us to match up the document with the actual site. Um, also, with amendments, like letter of credit amendments or surety bond riders, if your client can ask the financial institutions to also include the SRPPI numbers on those amendments, that's very helpful to us in the department. And finally, you may be getting correspondence back from the RFS FA unit now with a RFS PI number. We are creating RFS PIs and financial assurance activities for all financial assurance. So. Don't get excited or, or, you know, concerned if you come see an RFS PI and you don't have RFS, it's actually for your financial assurance. Next slide, please. Finally, what's the correct mailing address for financial institutions when they have to send the mechanism directly to the RFS or FA unit? Um, and first of all, if you're using the postal service, you can use the PO Box 420. If you're using an overnight courier like FedEx, uh, they can't mail to a P.O. box, so the uh, address on the right would be the address to use. Um, but I highlighted, obviously, again, the new mail code, which is 401-06K. It was previously 401-05S. That's still for BRAP, but the financial assurance documents should now be coming to 06K in the fund management section. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it. Any questions? All right, thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> um, we're going to do our next question segment now. Lynn, if you could come back on. We had um, a couple questions that were repeated and wanted some clarification from you. Thank you very much, Celine. Um, so I just, I read that there were a couple of questions that talked about the fact that the department had your application or your report for um, weeks, months, maybe even a year or more. Um, before you got your notice of incomplete, and you want to know about how to address that. And um, what the point I would like to make regarding that time frame is that the documents are assumed to be correct when you submit them. If you need additional time to address the concerns, then most likely your application should not have been submitted when it was. You should be able to address our concerns within 60 days and document the information to us. If there's special circumstances, please let us know what they are. You know, we can work with you. But um, if you feel the point I'd like to emphasize is Look at what you have submitted to us. If anything that you have seen or will see in this presentation makes you think that what you submitted previously is not, um, will not be sufficient for what we are looking for, please submit it to the department now before we get to your document. Give us the information. It's okay. We will take it. Um, we have an email address um, that we can provide for you um, that has, uh, that will go directly to um, BRAP if it is a permit issue, um, so that you can send us the updated application with the additional information. If you see that it's wrong, please correct it now. Don't wait for us to let you know. That was all. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Lynn. Um, next question we have in here. Um, Regarding how backed up is the um, BRAP review team currently? Sorry, back to that question. Back to me here. We're very backlogged. Oops, sorry, no camera. Here we go. There's a there is a there is a significant backlog. We are working through it. We are trying with the expedited permit applications to get um, those applications that can be expedited um, out as quickly as we can. We have um, 
new staff that have started, which should help, as well as um, we have staff from other bureaus that are helping us. We have um, an hourly that's helping us now. So hopefully we will be working with through that backlog as quickly as we can. Okay, and we'll just take one more question here. The question is, the groundwater wrap guidance directs the PRCR to implement the proposed groundwater monitoring plan in the permit application while it is being reviewed. What is the process for providing this information to the reviewer? What if you don't know who that is yet? I can answer that question. Um, yeah, you can send that uh, information. If, there, if you don't have a permit, permit reviewer sign, you can just send that information to me, or um, we'll also drop the uh, BRAP submissions uh, new email in the uh, in the chat uh, that Len, uh, Lynn was just referencing. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. At this time, we're going to go ahead and um, move on. Um, our next speaker is Michelle. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, again, I'm Michelle Clifford Tomaszewski. I'm an LSRP and PE at GEI Consultants. Um, for the next part of the presentation, we're going to go through the technical questions, and um, these tend to apply to some of the more practical applications. We've got some examples and some recommendations to uh, go through. Next slide, please. I'm probably going to say this about a hundred times in the next 10 minutes, but a huge part of the technical issues that the DEP has expressed while we were going through this is LSRPs just aren't documenting enough or documenting in a more in a straightforward enough fashion. Um, don't hide anything from them. Yes, every site is different. There are going to be different things. Everyone's fine with that. So document, 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 document everything that you have. Um, the wrap forms have very nice checklists in them. Um, they say, please attach this and please include this all over the place. If something's required, include it. Um, I think a lot of LSRPs think, oh, well, I just sent that in, you know, two months ago with the RAR. Doesn't matter. Go ahead and include all of the documentation, no matter how many times you end up doing it, um, if it's part of the required checklist. Next, please. Um, in... Question 15, it specifically goes over what um, documents are required for both soil and groundwater um, applications. This list is, uh, the screenshots directly out of the FAQs, and as I mentioned, everything is also outlined in the forms themselves. Next. And same for the groundwater applications. Don't think, oh, well, I just submitted that, and I don't need to submit it again. The reviewers don't want to go digging through looking for documentation, and you don't want them to start reviewing your application frustrated that they have to start digging through stuff. So just provide them that everything that they need so they can just start and be happy, and everything will just go so much smoother. Next, please. So here's where we get into some of the fun technical questions. Um, where should vertical delineation groundwaters be, groundwater samples be collected? I mean, the answer is you want to collect in the spot that you are most likely to find the impact. Generally, this is within the former source area or AOC that you're investigating. If the discharge occurred a long time ago, maybe you want to go a little bit down gradient, um, accounting for the fact that the flume has likely migrated. The DEP has a SIRI are a performance monitoring technical guidance that has tons of information on how you can come up with a conceptual site model and select these locations. Next, please. So here's an example um, that was actually submitted and based on the information in this application, it, the vertical delineation doesn't look great. Um, MW14, which the circle's a little bit off, but MW14 is over there on the left. The plume is shown in green. MW14 is approximately 70 feet side gradient of the groundwater plume and the only vertical delineation point. As you can see, the flow is parallel to this point. When this point is clean, what is it really telling anyone? If it's not dirty in the shallow there, why would I expect it to be dirty in the deep there? I'm not actually showing any sort of vertical delineation based on this information. Next slide, please. 
depending on the site specifics, including age and the type of the discharge and what contaminants you're working with, maybe this location, my little circle in the middle of the green here might make more sense. It's within the source area. It's a little bit down gradient to account for any migration of this bloom. The idea really is to find if there are groundwater impacts at depth. You don't just want to put a clean well so that you have a deep well and you say, check, got vertical delineation. And, the, and this is generally something that DEP picks up on pretty quickly. Um, so submitting something like this just really doesn't help anybody. Next, please. Um, our next question is about documenting um, deviations and variances. As many people today have mentioned, um, they're, every site's different. Nothing is going to follow the rules and the regs in exact accordance um, because of site-specific conditions. And everyone knows that. The LSRPs know that. The DEP knows that. Um, it's expected that they're going to be sticky situations. It's expected that we're going to have to imply some professional judgment, and that's fine. But when you do so, you want to document exactly what you are varying, varying or deviating from and include the lines of evidence as to why you were doing so in the other information section of the RAV application, and you want to include a standalone section in your RAR that discusses when these occur. Again, don't hide it. Don't try to sneak it. They're going to catch on to it, and then when they start looking and can't find any logic behind it, you're going to get a, you're going to get a letter, and you're going to get a nasty gram saying, why did you do this? We can't figure out your justifications and why it's still protective. And again, we often need to make these decisions, and it's, it's fine. Just document exactly what you were doing and why you did it. Next slide, please. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but this is a good example of documenting um, a variance that's discussed in the FAQ document itself. Um, this has to do with a well search, and an LSRP couldn't gain access to a potentially potable well. The LSRP states in this other information section exactly which citation they are varying from, and then they discuss that they made every good effort to gain access. They discuss the lines of evidence supporting why it's still protective. The LSRP lists exactly what section of the report where this variance is discussed, and they include references to applicable well logs and figures that all, that all of the multiple lines of evidence that support why it is this varying from this rule is okay. Next slide, please. Uh, question 19 has to do with technical consultations. Um, they, they've come up a couple of times today. The DEP is always available for a tech consult when needed. Uh, generally, you want to get them involved sort of after you're done with your RI, but before you're really into your remedial action. Um, this is generally a period where you have enough information to have a constructive conversation, but you're not so far down the road that you're now doing a remedial action that doesn't actually make any sense. Um, the tech consults are usually for sites that are complex or unusual circumstances. If you've got a small benzene bloom at a gas station, you know how to handle it. You don't need to involve the DEP. Um, if you've got an 80-year-old manufacturing operation, and you've got 100 AOCs and soil and groundwater and vapor impacts, and now, oh, we've got PFAS too. Maybe that's when you want to reach out and have a conversation. Um, if you do have a tech consult, you want to mention that again in that section K, other information of the RAP form. Next slide, please. And it can be short and sweet like this. Yes, we had a tech consult. Here's the date. The descriptions of the tech consult are included in these reports. And here's sort of what we agreed upon. Next slide, please. The outcome of tech consultations are not the EP approval of anything. They are meetings which the LSRP and the DEP and the PRCR sit and share information, share ideas on how to best approach the remediation at the site based on the current conditions and data. Once you move down the road, if things change, then those recommendations may no longer be applicable. If relevant data isn't discussed during the tech consult or not clearly presented, those recommendations might not be applicable. Um, for example, if new standards are published and things that everybody agreed upon a couple years ago, don't they may not be applicable anymore. Say we have a CVOC plume and a clay confining layer. The LSRP and DEP agree at a tech consult that, oh, TI is good. The solvents are above the clay. It's not going anywhere. It's under this big building. It's applicable. 
all right, now a few years later, the 1,4-dioxane standards come out. And you're finding 1,4-dioxane everywhere. Hmm, maybe it's not actually being confined by the clay. You need some additional evaluation. You're going to continue to collect data, but you can't just say, oh, CEP said it was okay in my tech consult. I don't have to worry about this 1,4-dioxane anymore. You, you really have to take into account the current data, the current conditions, and if things change, things change. Maybe you need another tech consult. Maybe you know exactly how you're supposed to handle it now. Like, in this instance, TI is probably not the answer anymore. Next slide, please. Uh, you also want to make sure to memorialize your tech consults. After the meeting, the all-star should write up an email and send it to the DEP. They'll provide a receipt to you that they got it. This gets documented at NGEMS for reference so that everybody's on the same page that this tech consult happened. Here's what we discussed. Everyone agrees. Um, and it, it just makes it easier. And again, mention the tech console in the section K. So when the reviewer starts to go um, through everything, they know that, oh, somebody talked about this. They already agreed on, on some things. Let me pull up that, that summary in NGEMS and take a look on, on what everyone was agreeing on. Um, that wraps up my technical questions, part of the FAQs. I think Dom is next up with the administrative. Thank you. Yes. Dominic, you're up next. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Good morning, everyone, again. Um, presenting here on uh, questions 21 through 25, the RAR administrative questions. Next slide, please. Question 21, uh, in reviewing documents, which version of regulations and guidance does the department use for comparison? So in reviewing remedial phase documents, the department will compare them to the regulations and guidances that were in effect at the time. So for example, uh, if you submitted a RAR with a groundwater wrap for M&A um, prior to the release of the um, updated M&A tec technical guidance, uh, in September 2022, um, if we start reviewing that, you know, after that date, we will be comparing that to the previous version, which I believe was the March 1st, 2012 version. Next slide, please. Where can a status update on the department's review of the RAR be found using data miner? Um, so to check the RAR review status, um, Number one, go to data miner, then select search by category. Next slide, please. Select slight remediation from the drop down menu. Next slide. And then under the license site remediation professional information section, um, there's a, a link that says license site remediation professional comprehensive report. Select that. Next slide. Enter the LSRP license number, and then it's recommended to unselect view report by pages as uh, if this shows every single submission um, under that LSRP license number. So if uh, you have a lot of submissions, uh, it may end up showing pages and pages and pages that you manually have to select through to find the report, uh, the RAR you're looking for. So if you unselect that, it will give you one page list of every single report. Next page, please, uh, next slide. Uh, and then from here, um, just to, as a kind of shortcut to find that case, you want to use the find func function in, um, for Windows, it's control F for Mac, command F. Uh, if you hold those down at the same time, then you'll type in the PI number, go to that RAR and check the status. So for this one, it says pending. Next slide. Um, as I was discussing earlier during the uh, RAR flowchart, um, BIR may conduct multiple technical reviews, uh, which may not be reviewed concurrently. Uh, so if you answered uh, some questions based on from one reviewer, um, it may not immediately show up as a completed status. There may still be pending reviews. Uh, again, as I stated previously, completed review status does not constitute approval of the RARs or indicate that BRAP has completed review of the RAP application. You'll have to check on that separately. Uh, and again, uh, BIR does not duplicate reviews associated with the RAP. Next slide. Question 23, what figure should be provided in the RAR when submitting a RAP application? Uh, 
You should include all the applicable required figures pursuant to NJC 726E, 1.6, and 5.7. I believe 1.6 is the general reporting requirements, um, and 5.7 is specific to the RARs. They'll have a list there of required figures such as site location map, land use map, uh, AOC maps, etc. Uh, some common deficiencies associated with RAR figures uh, would be AOC maps missing, um, AOCs where prior remedial actions occurred were not identified, uh, figures associated with BI investigation missing. So these all have led to uh, previous NTDs um, in the past. Next slide, please. This is an example of a, a good AOC map. Um, shows, you know, the AOCs, uh, breaks down, uh, we know where some wells are, uh, and some, uh, you know, underground utilities and, and things of that nature, uh, gives us a, a lot of information to go off of, uh, some additional features that you may consider, CA boundaries with groundwater flow direction, source removal areas, injection points, temporary well point locations, as I said before, underground utilities, and you know you're more than welcome to break out these maps into these figures into smaller portions you know AOC specific portions uh, should you choose definitely don't want to have one large map showing every single thing that we we, we want um, but when it when it comes to figures when when there's key information that's missing uh, those could lead to an NF, uh, NOI next slide please what table should be included in the RAR when submitting a RAP application. Once again, include all the applicable required tables pursuant to the tech regs 1.6 and 5.7. Um, <clears throat> uh, these tables should not only be lab generated, so they should be um, tabulated, created into actual tables uh, and not just copied and pasted from the lab report. Um, some often skipped tables are monitoring well construction details, pre and post injection monitoring results, and VI data. Um, these being missed uh, oftentimes lead to a previously an NTD, now it's the NOIs. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a, a good historic groundwater data table. Uh, you can see it shows the monitoring wells, where they were screened, dates of sampling, uh, depth to water, and, and it shows only the uh, contaminants of concern that we're looking for. So it's not showing, you know, if PAHs aren't a, a contaminants of concern at the site. Uh, you don't need to, you know, show those on here. This lists out everything, all the sampling data, so that we can see any trends over time. Um, you know, see if uh, Wells have cleaned up, if they're, if they're decreasing, increasing, what have you. Next slide, please. And this is uh, a model table that's taken out of the um, uh, historic groundwater sampling data in Appendix 1 of the groundwater wrap guidance. So you can see it's very similar to that table we looked at before, um, includes pre-remedial pre action data and then data from post remedial action, uh, sampling dates, uh, results, and uh, based on those contaminants of concern that we're interested in, depth to water, etc. Next slide, please. Question 25, should previously submitted information be included as an appendix in the RAR? So unless submitted through the online portal, portal in a prior report, all pertinent information previously submitted to the department should be included as an appendix in the RAR. Um, department may not have readily available copies of RIRs prior to April 3rd, 2016. This is the date when online submissions became mandatory. So if uh, you have an RIR prior to that or you don't think you submitted the RIR through the portal, um, then it should be uh, put in as an appendix to the RAR so that we can refer back to that information as necessary. And I believe that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, so, thank you Dominic. Um, our next presenter is Kenny. 
Good morning, everybody. My name is Kendrick Brown. I work in the Bureau of Inspection Review, and today I'll be talking about the receptor evaluation questions, the FAQ sheet. Uh, next slide, please. So question 26 basically says that can mailing be part of the door-to-door -door survey to determine the existence of unpermitted potable and irrigation wells? The short answer is yes. They are allowed. And we'll go ahead and with some examples. Next slide, please. So the receptor evaluation form has questions seven, eight, nine that deal with the well search and the door-to-door -door survey. As soon as we see question nine checked off as yes, we will be looking for that attached door-to-door -door survey. It can be attached directly to the form or just referenced in a section of the phase document report, but we must see something where it is provided. Um, marking off the questions below that, uh, the three checkboxes by itself will not satisfy the need to see it attached um, in some part of the receptor evaluation form or the phase document that's being submitted. Next slide. So this is an example of a letter that we will send if we do not see an attached door-to-door -door survey. It's pretty generic. Um, it pretty much highlights that we are looking for the unpermitted potable and irrigation wells. Um, you will have 60 days to complete um, the door-to-door -door survey. And um, we would like to have a response to the email, acknowledgement of the email within seven days. Next slide. So the response that was received after that generic pretty much stock email that we sent when we do not see the door door survey is that um, they had hand delivered about 77 cards with not um, with extremely disappointing results. So they were they asked if a 60 day extension would be granted and that is our policy now. So 60 days will be granted. Next slide. So the LSRP provided an update in between those 60 days saying that nobody had responded. So the 60 days came and went and I had not heard from the LSRP. So I reached out saying, please uh, provide an update on the door to door survey. There was a 60 day extension. So um, it's unsuccessful, professional judgment, multiple lines of evidence may be used. Um, just in case they were waiting for that 100% response rate, which is um, highly unattainable, but We'll go on with that. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the response that was received that, yes, wells, wells were identified within that half a mile search, which prompted the door-to-door -door survey to be done. Um, as you saw, the first round of mailings was unsuccessful. They went and did a second round of mailings, um, the bottom at number two right now. Um, what they ended up doing was they ended up sending an inspector in person to look for water, uh, water shutoff valves, water meters, they did conducted interviews, and they presented this in a, web, um, in a spreadsheet, and they also reached out to the municipal municipality and saw that there was being, um, water was being provided throughout the area that was being searched. Next slide. So the conditions were um, presented. These are those three check boxes that they worded it differently, but that's the information that's there. The conclusion was that the plume was restricted to the overburdened aquifer. Um, they saw that the municipal water source was being used for the area of the search. Um, there was the inspector that they had said went out and did the conducting of the water meters just looking in person. So with those multiple lines of evidence, you could say multiple lines of effort, um, it satisfied the department's door-to-door -door survey requirement. Um, we'll go ahead with another example. Next slide. So here we have another example where wells, uh, four purple wells were found, which prompted that door-to-door -door survey to be completed. Um, next slide. So in this instance, we have the response that, oh, all right. So there was a response saying that Although that there were properties within that door-to-door um, -door survey area, there was the Passaic River, which separated a good uh, percentage of them. So that, for instance, would be a line of multiple evidence that could be used to evaluate some of the houses that were required in the door-to-door -door survey. Um, it goes on to say that a second round of letters was sent, um, response rate, and there was only one remaining house 
that was connected to the municipal water supply. So that again shows that all the houses that needed to be evaluated were evaluated and just showing the multiple lines of evidence, multiple lines of effort, you can say that too, that were used um, satisfies the department's door-to-door -door survey requirement. Next slide. Um, yeah, just this goes on to saying that the only house that was um, did not respond to the mailing um, was connected to the municipal water. So it assures that nobody is drinking the potentially contaminated groundwater. Um, next slide. Next, we're going to do a test your knowledge poll question. Next slide. Please. A door to door, oh, sorry, a door to door survey is used to determine the existence of A, unpermitted potable wells, B, unpermitted ir irrigation wells, C, permitted potable wells, D, A, and B, E, none of the above. As a reminder, you do need to answer the poll questions in order to qualify for the credits of this course. Also, please do not forget about our service, uh, Survey Monkey. Um, we really appreciate any feedback that you provide. You will also see that in the chat. And please feel free to continue to ask questions in the question chat. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, um, and the answer was D, A, and B. All right. So moving on to question 27. Um, this question has come up. Um, what should be done when access is not granted for a site that requires a well or vapor intrusion sampling? Um, on the slide, there are a couple of websites that you can access, which will help with um, the tenant or the owner, which you might be having experiencing issues with gaining access. Um, there are different approaches on how you can maybe uh, push or steer or just convince or just show that it's for the overall good of the community or resident tenant that access should be granted just to make sure that everything is well or not well or just knowledge. Um, next slide. So there was an instance where a property owner across the street or a vapor concern condition didn't want their property tested. They were scared that the property value would have been lost. Um, the vapor concern site had been previously publicly funded, so the owner didn't allow access. But um, this is where you need to just use some people skills and just lines of evidence saying that this is for the overall your health maybe and just using multiple approaches. Um, you can also contact the health department of the municipality who might have trained professionals who are able to do some type of public outreach who are maybe better equipped to speak to people that may not want to gain access, grant access. Uh, next slide. So, um, yeah, this is an instance where the PRCR and the LSRP came together and they talked to the local health department who reached out to the property owner because sometimes if it's the local person from their local town who reaches to them, um, it might persuade them instead of just some person from LLC who's just trying to do some sampling. So maybe a face or put a picture to a face or a face to a name and you can just maybe have some better results. Um, and in this instance, the LSRP also printed out some information just showing that this is publicly accessible information, that this wouldn't be nothing devious or dubious or any, what have you. And um, yeah, just using different types of ways of communicating 
sometimes helps with some stubborn or just some apprehensive people that don't want sampling to be done for a certain amount of reasons. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so, um, so eventually the property owner granted access via have you with multiple lines of information that were provided to them and just maybe a different person, the local health department, but there are ways to grant uh, gain access for properties which are a bit apprehensive at the start. But um, please document all these attempts to gain access and you can put them in the phase document report or for your RAP permit application, what have you, but just provide information. And um, next slide. And that's it. Thanks, Kenny. All right, we're at our final um, question segment. Now we do have a few uh, repeat questions that are asking about expedited or prioritized RAP applications. So if a presenter could clarify in what case a RAP is eligible to be expedited and whether the flow path for an expedited review would be any different, that would be great. Okay, I'll be happy to go over that. Um, the expedited RAP process was emailed on July 3rd. Um, there was a listserv sent out, so hopefully um, you can go back through your emails and look for that. It's also listed on the SRP page on the top right as the most recent um, topic there. Um, but basically, there are five categories of, of situations where we will be expediting the review of those permit applications. And we requested that if you meet the requirements of those five, that you send in the application addendum uh, to the email address um, for, for BRAP so that we can get that information and prioritize your case. And if the um, if you have any additional, if you send in a new application and you feel you meet that those criteria, please include that addendum with your application. And very quickly, the five are. Hopefully, I'm going to get this right. One is soil um, uh, above res, below non res, um, needing a deed notice but not a cap, needing a using a presumptive remedy when a presumptive remedy was not required. Um, using an alternate remedy um, that was pre-approved by the department. Number four was historic fill only. And number five is groundwater with the CEA um, remaining on the property. And no deviations are allowed from those requirements. Um, we are just looking for cases that meet those scenarios. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Um, next question we have is, if the door-to-door -door survey was completed by a previous consultant, such as in the 1990s, and you do not have the full results or all responses, only a summary of what was identified, does the door-to-door -door survey need to be redone? Go ahead and say this. Um, it might not need to be 100% redone, but multiple lines of evidence should be added to that original survey with the information that was originally um, received. They're accessible, um, but that will be on a case-to-case, site-to-site basis, but you should always try to add a little extra just in case because time has passed and we like to see multiple lines of evidence. Okay, we have another question about door-to-door -door surveys. This one says, I heard in ethics training that the door-to-door -door survey requirement is dropping due to safety, safety issues. Is this not true? What you may have heard was the actual knocking, because I think there was a lot of disconnect with that. Um, the knocking aspect of 100% knocking on each door, we do not require that, but 100% evaluation of the properties which are in that area of search are, is still required. Okay. Um, we have another question here. When a well is discovered during the well survey and it must be sampled, what should it be sampled for to be compared to drinking water standards or class two, two groundwater quality standards? The guidance documents discusses both. 
Oof, I'm not sure if anybody's on this call that would be able to answer that a little more appropriately, but um, um, we can get back to you with that question. Okay. You reach out. Um, let's see here. We have another question. Um, for expedited reviews of groundwater wraps for the CEA on the property exception, how does the department view right of way, sidewalks, etc.? Is this considered to be off site? Yes. It is considered to be off-site. We're just looking for the property. We're trying to limit the extent of exposure to receptors and to the types of cases we are going to be reviewing. Sort of a follow-up question to that. If the CEA extends off-site but only into the right-of-way, such as the sidewalk and roadway, would that wrap application still qualify for the expedited review? No, it would not. It is off the property. We will hopefully be able to get to it faster, though, with the new 60-day time frame where we're not going back and forth repeatedly to um, permit writers. So hopefully um, that will enable us to get to your cases that much faster. Okay. And then, Kenny, we have a clarification here. Door-to-door um, -door clarification request regarding knocking. Are you saying that observations made from publicly accessible areas are acceptable instead of making direct contact with the resident? Uh, we prefer a method such as mailings, which may, puts a little distance with those safety concerns now with nowadays knocking door to door. But when you are able to actually send out a mailing, that owner may read and see, check off potable irrigation wells that were unpermitted or have you. You're saying is visually looking from publicly accessible areas, you might not be able to see a water valve or a water thing. So um, I'd recommend probably doing a mailing first before trying to just take a step back and try to just visually see it because you have the response from the actual tenant or property owner. It's a little better than maybe using binoculars from across the street trying to look at a water valve or a water pipe or what have you. But but there's multiple lines of evidence. I mean, you have the freedom to provide as much information and we'll take it a look, but we not have confidence that there are no unpermitted or potable wells or unpermitted irrigation wells. There's different methods of uh, accomplishing that. Okay, great. Thanks, Kenny. I'm gonna take one final question here. And just to let everybody know, we do have a lot more questions here. We're not gonna have time to get to them all. Um, but you will be receiving answers from us um, in the in the coming weeks if we didn't get to get to your question today. Um, just, so the last one I'll read here today I'm is. Sorry. I just oh, want sorry. to um, I, I just want to clarify uh, one thing that was said earlier. Um, samples regarding potable wells should be um, compared to the should not be compared to the groundwater quality standards, but to the drinking water standards. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so our last question today we'll read is, to confirm, the 60 days is for resolution of any questions slash concerns, not initial response to the NJDP permit writer. Is that correct? Uh, Julian or anybody uh, in BRAP? Yeah, so could, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sure. To confirm, the 60 days is for resolution of any questions or concerns, not initial response to the NJDP permit writer. Is that correct? It is 60 days for you to respond to the notice of incomplete. You can, we would like a response from you within 60 days to say, to address all of our concerns. It is for you to respond, not for the entire process to be resolved. But part of that response is, part of that 60 days is to give you time to do the work if that's what you choose to do. Um, also, remember to raise the issue through the chain of command and not just keep going back and forth with the permit writer or the um, reviewer from EIR. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Lynn. We're going to move on now to our closing remarks. I just want to say thank you to all our presenters today and every supporting staff who came in to help answer questions. Um, just a reminder, questions not answered today will be answered via email in the coming weeks. Again, please fill out our um, course evaluation on in SurveyMonkey. <laughs> um, I, again, will put it in the chat for everybody to use the link. It really helps us with knowing what you guys are looking for and for us to better present the information. Also look out for the email from the LSRPA regarding your CEC certificate. And um, also as always, all our slides, the handouts and presentation will be posted on the SR or CSRR training page. Again, thank you to everybody for attending, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.